first law is as follows. A robot may not harm a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey orders given it by qualified personnel unless those orders violate rule number one. In other words, a robot can't be ordered to kill a human being. Uh, rule number three, a robot must protect its own existence. After all, it's an expensive piece of equipment. Uh, unless that violates rules one or two. Thus spoke Isaac Asimov in 1942, outlining what are perhaps the most famous laws in science fiction. Literature and robotics have long been connected. And indeed, the very term robot comes from the Czech word meaning forced labor. And it was coined in 1920 by playwright Karol Čepek for his play R.U.R., or Rossum's Universal Robots. Interestingly, as late as the 1960s, robotics was still considered a toy or hobby field. And it wasn't until the 1970s that universities and government agencies began taking robotics seriously as a area of study. By this time, popular depictions of robots included Fritz Lang's Metropolis, Osamu Tezuka's manga series, Astro Boy, Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Now, I'm interested specifically in questions that arise at the intersection of literature and technology, questions that are raised by works such as Asimov's and Chapek's. Most of the depictions of robots in science fiction, literature, and film have focused on a particular kind of robot, namely the humanoid robot. And it's on this robot that I'd like to focus today. Now, even here at the University of Virginia, we have special robotics teams working on robotic applications. Runev Sukhil of the Computer Engineering Department has kindly helped me put together one such demonstration. Hello. I am now a humanoid robot from the computer engineering program at the University of Virginia. Hi, now, it looks like you have quite an audience. Yes, I am very popular. It's all about the viewer. It's not about attitude. It's the way you do, so it's very shrewd to me. So now, what can you do? What can't I do, Christian? I am pretty amazing. Now, what else can you do? Watch this. Here's a little something I've been working on. Thank you now. Thank you now. Okay. <laughs> All right, these robots are used for human robotic interaction experiments. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Goodbye. They're used for human robotic interaction experiments huh. here at UVA. Now, this is the point at which things start to get creepy. As early as the 1970s, Japanese professor Masahiro Mori published a paper in which he theorized something called the Uncanny Valley. Essentially, the Uncanny Valley posits that there is a relationship between our affinity for robots, 
and robots' relationship or likeness to humans. Now, in general, the more human-like robots look, the more we tend to like them. But there's a drop-off, a gulf or valley, at the point at which robots look about 70% human. Interestingly, Morey thought that once robots are physically indistinguishable from humans, our affinity for them would shoot up again. But this drop-off, the uncanny valley, is the point at which robots look eerily, perhaps even threateningly, human. Now, we've already seen the now robot's ability to interact with humans, but let's take a look at Sophia, a robot designed by Hanson Robotics to look like Audrey Hepburn. Sophia was also designed to imitate human expressions, such as amusement and confusion. Let's listen to Sophia in her own words. Being human must be truly amazing. You can see the beauty in a sunrise. You can appreciate the power of a symphony. Only you know how it feels to laugh with old friends. To be able to love, to feel intense emotion, to create life. I can do many things that humans do, but I can only dream of really being human. If that's not creepy enough, <laughs> take a look at the Japan Science and Technology Agency's Child Robot with Biomimetic Body, or CB Squared. Now, CB Squared was designed to learn as an infant does by seeing and repeating people's actions. Okay, CB Squared was also designed with a silicon skin that has, a, that has 197 tactile sensors that enable the robot to sense and respond to its surrounding environment. <laughs> As robots become more and more human-like, we're increasingly faced with ethical questions about how to design robots and how to treat them. At what point do we treat robots as machines, and at what point do we treat them as humans? As we've seen, scientists have increasingly designed robots to be more human-like. But being human does not always entail stellar qualities. Can a robot learn to lie, to cheat? Can a robot learn to steal? Can a robot make a mistake or break the law? And if so, at what point do we attribute these actions to the robot, and at what point to its programmer? Now, it seems interesting to think that even as we debate these questions, we've already given robots their own moral code. And here I'd like to return to Isaac Asimov's three rules, or three laws, which I think we can consider a robot's moral laws. Now, roboticists have taken these laws very seriously. And when designing a autonomous drone, for instance, uh, the drone is designed to, in case of an emergency crash landing, first avoid humans and densely populated areas, and only then preserve, insofar as is possible, its own systems and memory. But this ethical code is curiously limited in scope. That is, when we make robots, we don't apply Asimov's rules to include humans of other races and nationalities. And this is an ethical failing on our part. Indeed, it seems curious that we can have more sympathy for a robot that cannot feel, such as R2-D2, as he is about to be tortured and melted down. than we can for our neighbors, especially our neighbors in other countries. It seems apt here to revisit the uncanny valley, which we can, I think, apply not simply to humans' relationship with robots, but also to humans' relationship with other humans, especially humans who are manifestly different from ourselves. We tend to regard those who look like us, 
but who are not quite like us in the realm of the uncanny, and we often treat them as less than human. In fact, the further we get from people who look like us, the harder it is to care. In RUR, the play in which Carol Chapek first coined the term, term robot, Chapek gives us an extreme example of the consequences of failing to get past skin color and nationality. At the end of his play, robots conquer the human race precisely because humans fail to unite. Now, before the final showdown with the robots, the owner of the robotics factory thinks about what he could have done in order to prevent this from happening. He states, there will no longer be just one factory. There won't be universal robots any longer. We'll open a factory in every country, in every state. And can you guess what these new factories will produce? National robots. Each factory will be making robots of a different color, a different nationality, a different tongue. They'll all be different, as different from one another as fingerprints. They'll no longer be able to conspire with one another. And we, we people, will help to foster their prejudices and cultivate their mutual lack of understanding. You see? At the end of Chapek's play, robots have conquered the human race. And all but one human has been eliminated from the Earth. At the beginning of my talk, I asked about the relationship between robotics and the humanities. And I'd like to return to this question again. So what is this relationship? If the humanities have anticipated the field of robotics, robotics can nonetheless teach us what it means to be human, to be co-equal members of a collective, universal race. It's time we use what we've learned about the science and ethics of robotics to help us become better humans. Thank you. Thank you.